ladies and gentlemen. I would say uh, I'm very glad to be here uh, as a starting point. What, uh, what we have seen now from Afrin and uh, Ketia just uh, showed us uh, the good example of power of building uh, this learning ecosystem. I was with the minister last week in Nicaragua and we saw similar power. And that's, that's uh, what we all are here to discuss. But uh, now this panel is, uh, is a little bit interesting one because uh, we discuss the economic side of the smart education. So we are all talking about systems and how to make it happen. But uh, how about the economic side of this equation? So my first question, uh, and Mr. Minister Silas, uh, I'd like to address to you. And uh, the first question is, uh, dear Minister, we all come today with two schools of children who have a repeated benefit of uh, one laptop per child program in one. We have seen that. And they and their peers will be hungry for more as developed through secondary education. Because we are starting from the ground and, and building that. So, can you summarize your vision on how young people like uh, Evelyn and Katia will be able to develop their learning skills in Guadalajara with the ongoing use of technology and an involving curriculum to in tune with their digital aspirations? How do you see that? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, in Rwanda, obviously, from the beginning, we, we did realize that uh, we don't have uh, minerals. The only resource we have is our people. So we thought the best thing is really to, to build their, their capability, their skills, to be able to contribute to the economy. We have seen it happen in other countries. So from the beginning, uh, immediately after the war and genocide, the country made a decision that the only thing we are going to have is there to be the skills of our people. And this follows, in fact, a, a lot of, uh, of work, the issue of uh, putting up the proper infrastructure. As we heard, we have got about 4,500 kilometers in a small country. And in about uh, three years' time, we want to have collected about 97% of every part of Rwanda uh, connected to internet somehow. So also at the same time, over and above uh, uh, such infrastructure, we decided to use the one lap per child, you can see the product. Yeah. The kids, I wish they had demonstrated their programming uh, capability, but I suppose because of time. But you know, if you can go outside, as I said, you can find them there, you should go through that. So one lap per child was, uh, we were one of the few countries to start, to start uh, getting in, the, in this. And um, the other day, as I saw, we were, we were together in Nicaragua, and we saw how the private sector is helping the schools by providing this one of the child. Over and above that, obviously, we, 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 we insisted at higher education to, to use uh, you know, similar programs. Obviously, the gadget became uh, very expensive. <coughs> Especially, we're talking about uh, in Rwanda, three million students, both pre primary, primary, secondary, and university level. And this is, we have to look, it's not possible maybe to give one computer per student. Three million might be very expensive yeah. for the country to do that. Even if you work with the private sector, it might be very different. So, we're trying to look at the possibility of uh, smart classrooms, which can be an alternative way for smart classrooms. We're trying to, to look at uh, uh, the, the director you know, of, uh, of uh, Rwanda Education Board was here, and he talked about the new curriculum. We set up a new curriculum in secondary schools, but we have reached a point whereby we will not buy the hard books which we had, but we want to mix the two, both uh, the, the books and also the digitalization of the contents. And I'm very proud of a number of uh, companies who are here. We have talked to them. 
their experience with this level to utilize the contents and see how we can move forward to this. So we're going to start from having all the gadgets and also the issue of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, infrastructure. We now talk about the issue of uh, the bandwidth. I think it's been discussed here. The bandwidth when I came to run in 1997, it was costing about $10,000 per megabit per second. <laughs> and in, in, an institution could not manage to afford one megabit per second, and it invests of about maybe 15,000 students. But luckily, with the connectivity to the CK, because by that time we were using the, 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 the satellites, it was very expensive. Now it has gone down to about $150, $150. It's still very high, because I know in, the, in, the, in, the, in Europe and America, by those times when we were paying $10,000 per megabit, the same bandwidth was costing about $50 in a home, and so on so on. So we have to look at this and see how we can simplify it. So there are many steps which I've taken. And the final one, obviously, I'm glad you are here, you are the chair, is to agree with you and your company to put up a cost-effective gadgets in Rwanda, which we want to dispute into, into all our schools and, and also universities. The cost which you have given us is quite reasonable, and I'm sure other people would like to hear that, if you tell them. <laughs> and I think it's quite reasonable, and we have agreed that we should be purchasing 150,000 a year. And I'm sure uh, this is something small, it's a drop in the ocean, if it was the most important. So these are the things which are going on. Yeah. Maybe we can give more details later. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, my next question, is, in, in, instead of following the order here, I'd like to address to Mr. Liberata Lunza from Burundi. Uh, dear Mr. Liber, Burundi has uh, made great strides in uh, education in recent years. Uh, progress in uh, implementing the policy of free primary school tuition uh, has moved to Burundi up to Human Development Index. I am now seeing that uh, return on investment from your efforts with results in your education system now feeding back economically. Merci de m'accorder la parole. Je voulais d'abord préciser que euh, je m'appelle Augustin euh, Salino Major, euh, que je suis ici à la place de M. Rondouza qui est annoncé. Et, mais dans un premier temps, avant de, de répondre à, à ces questions, euh, je voudrais de ma part remercier le, les organisateurs de, de ce sommet, notamment African Lens et le gouvernement de, du Rwanda. Nous remercions. Euh, sincèrement, ces institutions qui ont invité le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur de leur chef scientifique euh, au Burundi pour venir participer à, à ce sommet. Euh, ensuite, je voudrais euh, présenter très brièvement le, le ministère de, de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche scientifique. Euh, le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur compte euh, 36 établissements d'enseignement supérieur et donc deux institutions euh, de l'université qui sont sous la tutelle du ministre de, de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche scientifique. Et l'enseignement supérieur compte autour de 50 000 étudiants, dont 60% de, de ces étudiants euh, sont dans le privé. Et nous avons aussi environ 450 euh, euh, enseignants de niveau supérieur. Alors, s'agissant de, de la question de de l'impact de, 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 de la question que vous posez, s'il y a un impact économique par rapport à la gratuité de la formation, et ici je voudrais préciser que seulement euh, il y a eu euh, une augmentation de la scolarité au, au niveau du primaire, mais aussi euh, augmentation euh, euh, de la scolarité des, des enfants, des enfants déscolarisés ont été scolarisés par rapport à cela, mais aussi la rétention et la rétention des enfants à l'école dont le taux d'achèvement s'élève à, à 90%, et ce qui contribue pour le Burundi euh, à, 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 la, à la réalisation des objectifs du millénaire pour le développement de, de l'éducation. Mais sinon, euh, je dirais que euh, l'impact est là. 
mais c'est difficile à évaluer étant donné que euh, c'est un programme qui commence et comme vous le savez aussi, euh, l'éducation est un investissement. Ouais. Donc l'impact est là, mais ce n'est pas mesurable dans l'année. Ok. Thank you. Ok, for me, uh, now the next question, uh, John, I think the next question is uh, to you. On, uh, yeah, dear John Davis, uh, as an industry leader, this will be a good opportunity for you to tackle the issue of costs. We all talk about uh, how, how to bring our costs down in uh, education. So technology is not cheap, in many cases uh, uh, considered luxury. So what programs can be put in place for reducing laptop, tablet costs, policies of governments on important duties, reducing internet costs, and uh, hence uh, the overall burden of students, families, and ministers of uh, education in Africa? Thank you, and uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here of the Broad Bank Commission as well, and our co-chairman of the Broad Bank Commission is His Excellency President Kagame. He's been to all ten of the meetings, and he leads us, and this is one of the subjects we discuss a lot, by the way, tremendous amount. And we have a wonderful report there that talks about reaching people with broadband, talks about some of the cost impacts. I'd love every one of you to read it. It's called Broadband, the State of Broadband, 2014. It's from the ITU. And a lot of what I'll talk about, um, of this period will be contained in there. If you look at costs, what's happened is you have to look at the total complete cost of the implementation, the cost of financing, the cost of the internet, the cost of the devices, and um, the cost of maintenance. All of that comes into the package. And so we've been working very diligently because under Broadband Commission, under Intel, we both have goals to reach everyone on the planet with technology or broadband and that means everyone in different ways. Um, and so as you look at this, look at the complete picture of what cost is. Um, the devices have moved down significantly. You can get laptops now that touch $200. You can get um, tablets that go down to $100 or less. You can get smartphones that can access the internet that are touching $50 and they move down. You also see a lot of children in schools um, sharing devices. They share telecenters, they share areas where I don't own the device, but I can pay a few pennies or a few local currency and actually have access to use them. So that becomes important. But the cost of devices has moved down. One of the biggest factors um, we've looked at, and if you look at the pie and say, what is the overall cost? Usually the device over a four year period is about 20, 25% of the cost. Yeah. So you have to take that because it's a big piece. So the cost comes down there. The second piece has been the cost of the internet. And the biggest single change there is what happened um, to the cell phones. It went not just on paying $30 a month and I get unlimited, but the use of prepaid. Yeah. That was what drove phones in voice all over Africa to big volumes. And it's doing exactly the same in broadband. So working, we've worked with all of the broadband companies in Africa. We've done promotions with many of them. We've got a tremendous amount of money into this. They put in a lot more, actually, I'm talking about tens of millions of dollars from us and hundreds of millions of dollars from the telecoms to get that prepaid broadband out. So rather than paying $30 a month, you can pay two or three dollars, you can buy in increments, you can get in many countries um, a gigabyte download for 50 cents or less than a dollar, and you can make that last a month. Particularly for a university student, and you have access to a wireless land in the daytime. So I've seen this used in many different ways. That's driven the cost down dramatically. Then you have to look at the cost of finance which is another factor, and in many places in developing economies, you see I can get a loan if I can even get one, and it might be 30% interest rates. And so you have to look at that piece, and then you have to look at what's the maintenance cost, and the keeping it going, and the software, and all this stuff around it. So look at that as a complete picture. So the best way I can describe this to you is a program we did in Senegal, and I described this to many of the people in the education section on Tuesday, there was a program where they said, look, we have laptops in universities, but 5% of our college students have a laptop. 5%. And they're spending two years or more of their life and using a sharing desktops in the libraries. 
And they said, I can change my education if I get 50%. I can go online, I can do distance learning, I can make electronic content, but I need to get that number up. So how do I do it? So we went and we looked, and we looked at all the pieces. The first thing we realized is the cheapest laptops wasn't going in the country um, because the volume was small in one case. But the second barrier was the 30% income duties and the taxation. So for the students, they removed that. That's a 30% drop there. Our customers immediately said, okay, now we can bring in the lower cost laptops into the country. It's safer. I'm not going to lose a fortune on a duty on a part I can't sell. And they started bringing in lower cost. The price dropped dramatically. Um, the prepaid broad, the broadband there was running $50 a month for the dongles and the 3G Unlimited. But we said the students don't need that, they need a small amount. So the telecom there offered them the $4 a month, um, very significant amounts of this, um, along with their package. Then we looked at the loans, and they were paying 30% interest rate, but most of them couldn't get the money anyway. That was why we couldn't get the laptops. And we brought World Bank in to do a loan guarantee fund to the banks. Conditions, number one, you lend it to the students or to their families, and number two is the interest rate being very low, five or six percent. That cut another ten or fifteen percent out of cost dramatically. But the biggest factor was actually the broadband, fifty dollars to four dollars is it's more than tax. Yeah. And so when you put all of that together, what happened is rather than them paying in the first year close to a thousand dollars and fifty dollars a month for unlimited everything, they were paying more like about two hundred dollars for four to under devices and then $4 a month thereafter. The government helped out a little bit with the Universal Service Fund, and in the end, the first year cost dropped from over 1,000 to 200, it's 5X, and the ongoing cost dropped from 50 to 4. 20,000 students picked that up, not 2,000. It was the, the taxes, the devices, the broadband, the cost of money, and the service funds that helped out with this. So everyone worked in together, the number went to 50%, the number's bigger this year, so they are. And it's a program you can do in any country. And so apply that technique to everywhere because everyone puts something in, everyone gets more customers, but the end customer, the students, or the education gets it for a much, much lower price if we all pull each of those pieces together. And I think that technique has to be used again and again and again because it works. Okay, thank you. I think it was a very <laughs> Very good insight, and, uh, and I fully agree with uh, the equation you are, you are drawing. Uh, next question, we will go to David Ferber. Nice to see you here. Uh, and then, Dr. Lee, it has been shown that the appropriate use of uh, the right technologies can accelerate educational improvement. Uh, example, students can make faster progress than uh, chronological progression. So, for example, making 50 months progress in uh, 12 months. Can you expand on this with uh, real world examples? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, thank you very much, Minister, for hosting the event. It's uh, been a fantastic event on a personal level. Uh, yourself and your colleagues and your teams have uh, made me feel so welcome in Rwanda for my first time. So thank you very much. And I do think that you have a very good future as a country if your two students we had this morning talking represent our, uh, represent the future of, of children moving forward into, into citizens. Um, <coughs> research and evidence is, is very important in education to, to prove that you are, what you're investing uh, in technology is actually uh, having the outcomes that you want, want them to have. There is an issue with um, research in technology and education is that research uh, traditionally can be two or three years long and of course technology changes much faster than the research can take place. So it can be a very, very difficult thing to, to put in place. So what we're seeing a lot more now is a lot more action research um, over a short period of time um, with, with small scale prototypes that are run and action research, research that runs alongside that. Um, I myself have been involved in a project in Brunei in Southeast Asia with the Ministry of Education there where um, it was a prototype model was built um, using technology in the schools um, with just 20 schools to begin with and uh, researchers from universities in the UK were involved um, in capturing the data because obviously if we start research now for two years in two years time who knows what the, what the future might hold both in terms of the technology, the devices and John was talking about the connectivity. 
Um, so there are, there, are, there are actual examples, there's been a lot of research into the uh, effectiveness of technology uh, in education. For example, the Marzano Research Laboratories in the USA um, carried out um, year-long research piece into the use of interactive technologies and uh, interactive uh, um, online assessment. Uh, and they found that for students who were using that, there was a 17 percentile increase in their progress over those who weren't. Um, but there are conditions attached to these kind of things. Um, first of all, they, they said that the best progress was made where you had experienced teachers, usually with 10 or more years of service. And actually that goes against my perception of, of the young teachers who have been out of college being used to using technology, being the ones who are most effective practitioners in the classroom. But actually it was the more experienced education practitioners were the ones who uh, had showed the most, uh, most effect. Um, also those teachers would have used technology for at least two years themselves, so there's a lesson for us in our professional development and training we put for our teachers when they use uh, technologies. Um, and also if they have a high confidence in technology. Not all the research is, has, has been rosy. There are examples of uh, education research, for example, the One Laptop for Child Program in Peru. Um, where the um, Inter-American Development Bank research there in 2012 showed that uh, there was no noticeable gains in English and mathematics, but there was um, gains in their cognitive skills and cognitive abilities. So we have to be very careful about uh, what we do, but the important thing is to learn from that kind of research for yeah. implementations that are happening, for example, in Rwanda. So we have to learn the lessons from what's happening there. Um, so it's very, very important that, that um, research and evidence is there to show that the cost effectiveness is there, um, also to show that we are showing what I describe as education productivity. Um, and it's not just about the economic productivity, it's about what, what do you get as a society, what do you get as an economy uh, at the end of that. Very good. I, I, I fully agree with you. At the end of the day, we are all looking for uh, not only uh, how how uh, we get in terms of uh, financial benefit, but uh, how the whole society grows uh, paved by the investments we are, we, we are making. Okay, uh, my my next question, and in the next round, I think for the sake of time, we should be a little bit uh, faster. Uh, Mr. Silas, Mr. Minister, again. Uh, during the course of, uh, of this summit and in public statements, you have mentioned how you envisage that uh, it's the private sector that plays a key role in ICT's education. And that's, for me, is a very interesting question to, to ask you. Uh, well, that private sector is here for a summit uh, lasting for a few days, yet it's the follow-up uh, that really matters. What's your policy advice to people in these audience of uh, what they need to do next to return to Rwanda? So, again, during, in the course of, uh, of this summit and in public statements you have mentioned, how you, you envisage that it's the private sector that plays the key role on ICT uh, for education? So, well, the private sector is here, okay. and for assuming it lasting for a few days, uh, it's the follow-up what matters. Okay. So, what's your policy advice to people in this audience on what they need to do next to return to Rwanda? Uh, uh, first of all, to return to Rwanda is the easiest. I mean, <laughs> if, if you want, for anyone, for any African, in Africa, you can always come to Rwanda without a visa. In a time, anybody else, you can always apply a visa when you land, or you can apply on the internet and you get it to them one day. I think it's experienced quite a number of you people. So to come to Rwanda that way is, is much easier. On the other hand, um, I had a lot of discussions uh, with what a number of the private sector people yesterday, and I'm continuing with them today. It's very exciting to see. Uh, what they can do for the education sector in Rwanda, not only in Rwanda, I'm sure for the other colleagues in Africa. I think there is a, it's, it's very exciting to see there are many things which they can do for us. Um, issues of infrastructure, we have talked about it. I'm glad to hear John uh, ABC are talking about 
uh, megawatt costing four dollars. Uh, I think this is something which I think we need to investigate and see how we can get that. Because then you can have hundred, you know, in our institutions, uh, institutions of higher learning in Europe, in America, they talk of uh, gigabytes, gigabytes, while we talk of megabytes, which is something which is totally different. Yeah. And that's because we, we, maybe it's a question of cost. Our cost here seems to be more expensive than in, in Europe. So this is it. But for the experience of, uh, of, of uh, the private sector, we have talked to two here, and based on the experience in some other places, I think we can work together to reduce the cost of, of, of uh, our, our students, our education institutions, accessing technology in so many ways. I mean, you are one of the examples which I, I talk about uh, from discussion with you and agreeing with you. It is something which we could not afford in the past, but now we can afford it. And the fact that quite a number of companies here are able to digitize our materials, it also reduces the cost of, 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 of education and so on and so forth. I'm glad that quite a number of uh, companies here can train our teachers, because teachers' component is very critical. And I'm looking forward to work with quite a number of, uh, of, 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 of you people to try and uh, train our teachers because these are the, the engine of, of our education system, and reducing the cost of, of training. Uh, we had a, an example where our teachers, there was a survey done by, by HP, which is very important in terms of readiness, and they were asking our teachers, and the, and the teachers were saying, look, we, some of them said, we cannot use the gadget because we don't have time. Yeah? <coughs> From our normal teaching, we don't have time to use the gadgets. But they don't know that if you start using the gadget, it will actually cut down the time of your teaching, and then you can use the gadgets much more, even if it's better, and so on and so forth. So, uh, as I said, we have discussed quite a lot of, uh, of the private companies here. There's a lot of goodwill to work with us, and I'm sure there's a lot of goodwill to work with our, our other uh, African countries. So we look forward to a, a going further than what we did, what we discussed, and start implementing the discussion which we had. So in terms of uh, coming back to Rwanda, I think you can say that we have one of the best weathers around. This is 24, 12 months a year. Okay, there's a bit of rain and so on, but still, I think it's not such a bad rain. You can see how, how green it is, you can see how clean we are, and the priests are far to inviting me again to receiving you and hosting you in Rwanda, and we continue the program which we are discussing today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, following our panel, now my next question is uh, to Mr. Nigra Burunza. Mr. Burunza is president, yeah, uh, Niku Rumziza, is that right? So, has established an ambitious project to redevelop the country through the use of ICTs. So, the first phase of uh, Fiber Rock complemented eight of uh, 17 provinces in Burundi. Can you please give us an update on how much more has been rolled out and what strategy you have to connect the schools to allow them to utilize the power of these e-learning technologies? la politique nationale de développement des technologies de l'information et de la communication afin de rendre moins coûteuse la, la connectivité avec un débit très rapide. Mais à ce stade, ce projet a connu un retard pour des raisons d'ordre technique, si bien que euh, la couverture euh, de la fibre optique reste limitée à, à 8 provinces seulement sur province. Euh, alors, euh, mais le projet n'est pas encore achevé euh, pour alimenter les, les écoles. Euh, euh, si bien que la stratégie maintenant qui est adoptée, c'est d'alimenter les écoles euh, qui disposent de, de, de matériel informatique et de l'électricité. 
Euh, je voudrais ici préciser que, euh, au niveau de, de l'enseignement primaire et secondaire, la, la connectivité n'est pas euh, tellement avancée. Mais si c'est au niveau de l'enseignement supérieur, où euh, la plupart des, des établissements d'enseignement supérieur sont connectés euh, sur la fibre optique, et tous les établissements euh, sont dotés d'équipements de, 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 de informatiques et, et des ordinateurs, et aussi bien que euh, l'enseignement euh, se déroule normalement et les TIC jouent un rôle très important dans, dans la formation. Il y a notamment l'utilisation de, de la bibliothèque numérique et nous sommes déjà lancés dans le système de euh, bachelor, master, euh, doctorat. Et à ce niveau-là, alors nous sommes obligés de, de, de recouvrir le TIC parce que les étudiants doivent faire des travaux dirigés, doivent faire des travaux les travaux personnels et grâce à ces travaux personnels alors les étudiants doivent faire de la recherche grâce au TIC et ici je voudrais préciser quand même que nous sommes toujours en train de chercher la, la coopération et des investisseurs pour nous aider à avoir plus d'équipements pour que nous puissions améliorer notre système d'éducation par, par les technologies de l'information et de la communication merci Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now I still have uh, two questions uh, for, for the sake of time. Uh, I think we have five minutes here. Uh, first, uh, John, again, to, to Intel. The Intel World uh, Program has a vision of uh, enhance uh, lives through accelerated access to technology. What, what's very good. Uh, this is a noble vision, but uh, here we have ministers and officials from across Africa who work with day-to-day -day reality on what happens on the ground. So, is there not a disconnect between such a dream and the current reality and what should be done? Even more to the point, what are you doing to bridge that gap? Okay, it's a great question. Um, the reason we put together a group like World Ahead and um, have visions and missions is we say in Intel we want to reach technology to touch everyone's life in the next decade. I say on the broadband commission it says I want to be able to connect everyone in the next decade or more. And so those visions are needed. But then it comes down to exactly as you say, how do you do this and yeah. what's the reality? So many different pieces of this come together. In Intel we have a number of people around the world close to a hundred of these called biz dev people. And what it means is they don't sell chips and they're not doing pro they do programs to reach people. It's exactly what they do. I have five of them with me in, in this room that have been part of this. You have um, three biz dev people there, someone that works pedagogy, and someone that works teacher training programs. And they work with the countries. And those programs exist in well over a hundred countries to put that together. So for example, as you talk about a laptop program here in Wanda, we'll end up doing a workshop in a couple of weeks to talk about the teacher training. What's the content? How do you connect the schools? What about the rural schools? How do they work? And look at all the pieces by working with the countries. It's a plan, it's a workshop. We have architects that go around and do that as well. Now, as you look at leading this, this is the 110th country I've been to in the last decade. So I've been to a few. It'll be 111 before the end of this year. But in the last visit to Colombia, I didn't go to Bogota, I went to Barranquilla, Cali, Medellin, and two other cities. It wasn't the capital city. I went out in seeing what goes on. So you can see what a rural school is like, what a rural hospital is like, what a farmer is trying to do in Bangladesh to raise their crops, what fertilizer they need, or in the rice fields in Cambodia. You go out and look at that and see how you can bring technology so this that people do this and we work the enabling now it's always now pvp so what we're trying to do here is sit down and talk with the governments about what you're trying to do in terms of universities schools clinics small businesses startups jobs um, how does technology help them and make it so that it's your program i'll tell you i've done many of these where if the teachers don't think it's their program in their country they don't want to be trained. Then you can't get an implementation of a, 
of a laptop program down in the country if the teachers think this is a problem for them. Mm -hmm. You want it to be their program created their way. So in doing these programs, we've trained teachers for 15 years. There's always a little bit of local country, not just language, but optimization. The trainers have to be local people. Yeah. In Rwanda, it'll be Rwandan people. In South Africa, they're South African people. In Nigeria, they're Nigerian people. In Uganda, they're Ugandan people. And it becomes their program. And so all of it is what's the country plan that gets created? And I'll assure you that every one of these is different. It all comes from the best practice book, like a playbook. But you take different pieces of it, you work with the locals and make it exactly what the locals want. And that's what these team of people do. That's what they're paid to do. Make local programs. They're not paid to sell laptops or chips. They're paid to make the programs work. Exactly. And if they work in the country, I'll tell you, it's amazing business. It works for, it's win-win. It works for everyone. The people, the country, the technology companies. And that's how you have to do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And my last uh, question uh, for today, uh, to David. David, uh, many previous uh, and uh, current ICT programs in Africa are focused on providing technology to students. Various one-to-one -one, uh, programs, uh, as we said. Some of these initiatives miss the key educational issues in each country and you and the use of ICT can be often misdirectly and largely a waste of resources. Uh, what's your vision on a fresh approach to this challenge of addressing the key educational issues? I, I have an, an issue with look, talking about technology implementation programs in education because we should be talking about education programs that just happen to use technology. And that's been the big mistake in a lot of countries, that they've looked at the technology, then thought about the education needs afterwards. Yeah. And, and it sounds so simple, but it has been a bit of a big mistake in some places, uh, particularly in Asia, where I've done a lot of my work, um, and some of the very competitive Asian economies where uh, they're competing against their neighbours and they see it has to be the latest and greatest. Um, we've also seen quite a lot of examples where, um, uh, again, predominantly in Asia, where the decision making on what implementations take place are politically driven. Um, because if you provide technologies that support the teacher outside the classroom, which may be what is needed in that instance, it doesn't have as big a visual impact as putting devices in every child's hand. Um, and and that, that is, that's something that I've seen quite commonly as well. So that sometimes the politics drives it, not the actual need of the economy in the country. Um, but your question talks about some one lumped up a child's um, Things not working, and I give an example in, in Peru, of course, and uh, I'd say that certainly isn't the case here in Rwanda, and uh, the other examples we've been discussing. Um, but I think it's, it's a coming back to let's talk about the education first. If it's teacher development and teacher skills we need to work on, let's let's put what's in there that there first, okay. um, but, and that, that's that's the, the crux of it. Let's look at the most important themes that matter in education, then develop the technology programs that actually support that. So it's coming from the backwards direction, which we all know about, but quite often, sometimes, the implementation of it is, uh, is not happened. And as a former teacher myself, if somebody gives me a piece of technology, I always ask two questions. What if, and so what? Yeah. So what? What does it do for me as a teacher? What if? What can I do? What's the potential to improve my teaching? Fantastic. And I think a good example we have seen last week, Silas uh, in Nicaragua. And, uh, and how they have uh, a full uh, ecosystem to bring the teachers together, the students repairing machines, things that uh, build what we call a sustainable educational system to, to support the projects that we are discussing. There were actually many hours, many hours uh, repairing the computers. And this was amazing to see the small kids in schools preparing themselves. They can maintain the computers for a period of five years or so. Yes. It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's, that's it for, uh, for uh, uh, this section. I think the, the, the next step, uh, over the last uh, two days, uh, thanks to, to the team in Rwanda, they have announced that uh, uh, Postivo 
BJH is, is coming to Rwanda. And the idea now is uh, to do a short presentation and explain a little bit uh, who we are. So, the first thing I'd like to say is I'm very happy to be here because uh, we, we closed the contract with uh, Rwanda. Uh, Government that was not an easy one, and, uh, and now uh, the plan is uh, we are going to have our first factory in Africa here in Uganda. And, uh, and I'm also happy because this is a first step towards what I would call a very promising future. So. What you see in the screen is we are here to build the future, but uh, we are here to help you build in the future. That will be the right working through, through this plan. But uh, at the end of the day, who are we? You, you, you see in the bottom here, you see positive BGH. But uh, positive BGH is a joint venture between uh, two groups. First is uh, Positivi, that's from Brazil, and BGH from Argentina. Positivo is a uh, 40 years old uh, company making today, let's say, 2.5 uh, billion dollar heavy. And Positivo has two divisions. One division that is the IT division, from where we get uh, computers, tablets, but, uh, but uh, we have also to understand that Positivo started as education company. So Positivo started in Brazil with schools. Uh, they, they have today universities. They have today uh, technology development centers. So Positivo grew in Brazil delivering material to the government. And the government asked, hey, now material Printed material is not good enough. Let's go to digital material. And that's how positive grew in Brazil. So we have a strong legacy in education. At the other side, we have BDA. BDA is 100 years company in, uh, in Argentina. And uh, BDA can deliver all types of consumer products from TVs, uh, Air conditioners, microwaves, whatever you name it. And on top of that, uh, also BGH uh, can provide network infrastructure for, for communication. So, at the end of the day, Positive BGH is a joint venture between those two uh, companies. We are the first multinational. ICT company in uh, Latin America. That means we grow as a company in a development country. That's why when we come here today and start talking to Wanda, we understand the needs because we have suffered through all these years uh, developing a business in, uh, in South America. Uh, our mission. I, I can take from here only the first phrase on, the, on, uh, on this mission. Our technology uh, is to bring your technology accessible to transfer people lives. We just saw here the two kids coming. The first transformation you do in people life is when you bring a computer to a kid, this kid brings that to the family, and suddenly you see families and uh, fathers, mothers, using the computer and discussing that. We saw that in, in Nicaragua a few weeks ago, and that's the first step on transforming people life. The second step on transforming people life is, when you have a factory here, we are going to hire, train, and develop it, the professionals we need here. I don't want to bring 150 uh, experts to be here running the company. We want to run the company with the people that is here located in Rwanda. To be honest, uh, you see, I have four people here. And among them, two people are going to stay, and they are going to be the seeds 
of our factory here in, uh, in, in Juan. All the rest is going to be developed by using the local people, the local community. Where are we? Only for you to have an idea the size of Postgill BGH. Postgill BGH today is very well located in South America. We have five factories there, and now the first, the very first factory in, in Juan. But what do we do? Uh, we have been talking about education. And, uh, but uh, we, we can supply a full range of products on top of education. So, we have the track record of education coming from Postivo, and we can supply a full ecosystem of education. But when we bring a factory to a new company, uh, you cannot come and say, hey, I have a very good contract now with one government, and when the contract is over, I go out. We are here bringing a full range of products because we like to create an industry. We like to generate jobs. We like to generate expertise in the uh, in, in world. Uh, on top of that, uh, both groups, positively, BGH, uh, we have been building factories and we have the resources, the financial resources and the expertise to do that. So now we are committed to create what I have been telling them in my first email, Made in Africa products. Uh, when we talk about the educational system, education, uh, when I joined Positivo BDA, I said, hey, uh, education is a very important talk because you can sell computers. We have been discussing over the last days here, we can sell computers. And many times we sell computers to governments that don't know what to do. So the very important thing is to create a, a very healthy ecosystem around uh, these uh, 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 educational. And uh, what we are doing here is we have positive engaged. We are now in the process of creating what I call strategic alliances. And very strategic alliances. It's not only a partner, it's strategic alliances. Now we are building a strategic alliance with uh, OLPC, because OLPC has done projects around the globe, and we believe that we can complement what uh, OLPC has done. We are here also together with uh, Intel because I believe that Intel can bring the, the, the basis for us to get the volumes and together with the volumes we bring cost down. And bringing cost down we make computers affordable. And that's what is important for any government that uh, we, we, we are talking about. If I take along uh, Positivo and uh, OLPC, we have sold together, as per today, 5.4 million computers to schools around the globe. Only Positivo BGH we have supplied in Argentina, Uruguay and Brazil, 2 million computers. And that's important, but I have been so far providing computers. Now I have, I'd like to bring partners, ecosystem, to bring content out on top of them. Because that's, at the end of the day, what matters. So, and we know how to make it happen. Uh, this chart, I think that is quite a powerful chart. Because this is how we start in South America. I would say we have the ambition, energy and drive. And we have done that before. Because if you see this chart, in 2004, we started in, uh, in South America selling 100,000 computers. In 2013, we sold 3 million computers. That means uh, annual growth of 62%. Don't tell that we don't know what we are doing. We are coming to Africa now, that's our first seed. And from Rwanda, I would really hope to get to the same level as we are getting in South America. Then let's talk about the Rwanda project. Our ambitions here are not small. So, 
in, in Rwanda. First is why we are here. Because we see a GDP of uh, average 8.8%. 8 we see uh, robust uh, governance here. We see a uh, uh, friendly and healthy environment. But what we see in Rwanda today is, and what the uh, minister has been saying, we need the private sector coming that believe on what they are building. So we are here to help. We believe on what they are doing, and that's why we signed the contract uh, last day, last, uh, last Saturday. So what are our steps in Rwanda? We are not here to build a very small factory with one line, uh, and then if it doesn't work, we walk out. So we have our stages, we have our steps in anyone. The first step is, uh, as I did so far, the first step is education. We are getting into Rwanda as to provide computers for education, following the OLPC computers, but now also providing computers to fifth grades to the schools of Rwanda. But the next steps, we want to bring uh, mobile phones. The next step, we want to bring TVs. And we will keep growing. But uh, one very fundamental point for any company that is coming to a country is, of course, we need an economy of scale. And how we drive it? Economy of scale, in our case, is first, we provide diversified food portfolio. Second, I think we have been talking with uh, a lot of people here is how we can export out of Rwanda and make competitive products to Africa. The third point is uh, uh, how we serve the local market in Rwanda. Because not only education, but Rwanda has their own local market. And it, even a last point that uh, we are open to that is once we establish manufacturing center here in Rwanda, uh, we should look and, and say, whoever other company wants to work with us in the, in the model of contract manufacturing, you are very welcome. Only to give you an idea, in uh, Argentina today, we make the computers for Toshiba. Because at the end of the day, when we start about manufacturing, when we start, uh, John was talking about cost, it's also a really economy of scale. How we bring the economy of scale in? And we have to bring this economy of scale in Africa. So, for me, the, what I call sustainable growth uh, system is the very first layer of this chart is we have to engage with government, and I think we, we are going through a very, very good path now, but we have to engage with the people of Rwanda. Because when we talk with the people of Rwanda, it has two sides. One is the schools. The schools is where we are going to get the skills, the schools is where we are going to get the knowledge. And if necessary, we are going to Help them say what type of skills, what type of, uh, type of knowledge we need to develop our industry. The other side is the community. We have to go to the community because I don't want to bring people from South America to run factories in Africa. What we have to do is to train, hire, and develop professionals here in Rwanda. And that's the side that I say, people's side of, uh, of Africa. In the middle, we have the government. Because with the government, we have to work together. We have to develop infrastructure. We have to develop alliances with the other governments that are, are, are here to make this project something that is, is really something to grow. But then, on top of all the discussions we have in Rwanda, we have the second layer. And second layer is what I call the private sector. Alone, we cannot do that. We have to start building what I call strategic alliances. We have to start building what I call global partners. 
I've been talking with uh, Intel that is here, Microsoft, Google, whatever. We have to bring all these industries together. Uh, positive media in the center, we have our commitment to build the factory, we have the commitment to bring the expertise, we have the commitment to bring technology. And also we have been talking with a lot of uh, financial institutions to finance this whole project. For me, that's what I call the equation of uh, sustainable growth. Because if we succeed bring all these elements together, then we have a very healthy future in Africa. So, my last slide is, uh, I have been living in China for the last five years. And this is a Chinese problem. They say, when wind of change start blowing, some go high, but some start building windmills. I see that the uh, government is trying to build windmills. And we are here to help. Thank you.